Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, invite Brian up to the stage. Brian Sullivan is from AT&T, and he's one of the, uh, the platinum sponsor for W3Conf, and he's going to say a few words about uh, AT&T. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, everybody. On, on behalf of AT&T, we'd like to thank W3C and everybody who attended to, to give us the um, opportunity to sponsor this event. Um, you know, at AT&T, we, we believe that HTML5, CSS, and web technologies are at the center of an application ecosystem which, is, which will soon rival naval, native web or native application development ecosystems and, and certainly already ex, uh, extend it in terms, uh, exceed it in terms of reach. Um, since we launched PocketNet back in the 1990s, we've been bringing uh, technologies and standards to market which, which enable developers to serve the mobile web uh, market. We believe that, that the, the key things that we, we've always focused on in this are functionality, usability, and interoperability. And we believe that this requires a, a long haul focus, that we can only achieve this through a process of, of ideation, of collaboration, and of continual focus on an open standards environment in which the, we can provide these things. There's a couple of things that I'd like to mention. Um, in the uh, brochure, you, you received a card about the AT&T um, API beta. Okay, this is a, a place in which you can learn about network APIs that AT&T is, is making available in a sandbox environment. Uh, also, in January 8th and 9th, we're going to be hosting our AT&T Developer Summit in, in Las Vegas two days before CES. So we invite you to participate with us um, in, in these things where possible, and, and we thank you again for the opportunity to, to co-host this session. And back to Doug. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. And again, thanks again to uh, AT&T, to uh, Adobe, to Nokia, and of course to Microsoft uh, for sponsoring this event, for making it possible, in fact. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Art Barstow from Nokia, Paul Cotton from Microsoft, Tantek Chelik from Mozilla, Charles McCarthy Neville from Opera, Chris Wilson from Google, and Peter Vossall from Amazon. Uh, all of you are guilty of having browsers, <laughs> and this is your trial. So, uh, to all of you out there, uh, I, I appreciate your participation in this event. Um, this panel is not going to be nearly as interesting if we don't have any set if we don't have any questions. So, it's as interesting as fun as you guys make this. So, I'm going to give them a, a an intro question, and after that, I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. And please do come to the mic or I'll lock the doors, and you won't get out until you come to the mic. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the opening question that I have for each of you is just sort of a, a, a softball, and uh, tell me something interesting or unique about your browser, someplace, something that puts it in an interesting place in the ecosystem or some feature of your browser that, uh, that, that you think is, is notable to, to the audience. So, yeah. One of the things that I think is somewhat interesting uh, about Nokia is that we've, you know, literally shipped millions and millions of web browsers, and uh, and some of those web browsers have been written by us, um, uh, you know, from from the ground up. We have others that have been based on the, the WebKit open source project. Uh, on our one of our Linux systems, we had uh, a Gecko-based browser, and I think we've shipped browsers from from Opera. On, on certain devices, and uh, and I'm real real happy you know that we now have a a uh, series of devices coming out that will have uh, that will be based on Windows Phone. So I think that's somewhat unique for us as a device manufacturer to have um, really an interest in uh, in broad browser interoperability. Thanks, Owen. Uh, Paul. So. Um, Starting with IE9 and continuing with our efforts uh, in the platform previews in IE10, I think Microsoft has tried to drive home the message about uh, all the web developers should be able to use the same content across all of the browsers. And we're really, uh, there's been a lot of sessions at this uh, conference giving you hints about how to use things that don't, in effect, have the same content. 
So I think uh, we re really want to uh, emphasize to people when they're looking at IE that they look at it as being the browser that will sets uh, in some way the bar for the content that you should be trying to use in your websites. We're really trying to emphasize picking the stable specs and then moving those into IE9 and now into IE10. And I think that's a really good guidance for web developers to pay attention to. Thank you, Paul. Tontek? At Mozilla, we're, uh, we're the only nonprofit here, uh, which, which means that sometimes we have a bit of a different focus and that a lot of our decisions are, are what we call mission-driven, uh, which sometimes has to do with advocacy uh, for the open web, which a lot of us uh, believe in and work hard at, and sometimes means we have to make some hard decisions. Uh, like, for example, uh, this past May, uh, there was a plugin called uh, Mafia Fire. Any of you heard about this plugin, this add-on? A few folks. So the uh, government asked us to take that down because they didn't like the fact that it routed around, uh, shall we say, censorship of various sites on the internet. And we basically said, well, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing our, our chief counsel, with what court order? And they didn't get back to us and published that all publicly. So apparently that wasn't good enough. And uh, now there's legislation related to that that specifically contains measures designed to force Mozilla to take down things like that. And uh, for, for more information, I'll just leave you with a little plug at that. If you can check out mozilla.org slash SOPA, and that'll give you the rest there. Thanks. Thanks, Dante. Charles? Uh, so Opera is Norwegian. That's kind of unique. <laughs> <laughs> more, more seriously, like Mozilla, yeah, we actually make a browser and that's it, right? That's pretty much the company. But we're a commercial company. We make money, use it to pay our engineers, get it from customers who are prepared to pay for what it is we've got to offer. So we don't have you know, a great loss leader strategy to you know, run the browser and do something else. We have a product that we make for customers who are prepared to pay for it because that's what they want. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Chris? So I won't presume to speak for all of the great people on the Google Chrome team, since I'm still <laughs> transitioning into that team. I think the, the thing that I find really unique about Google's efforts in the browser space have been from the very beginning, their goal really was to make the web platform better, to take the web platform from where it was three, four years ago and turn it into something that really could replace native platforms. And I think that they've made some really great strides in that from you know, really kind of goosing the other browser manufacturers to, to focus on performance to even you know, simplifying the user experience as well. And I think that's, that's what I'm really looking forward to. Thanks, Chris. And finally, Peter? So I guess one thing that's unique about our browser is that it's only been in customers' hands for literally days <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> years or even decades. Um, but uh, so, so our browser is Amazon Silk, which um, is shipping with the Kindle Fire device that started shipping this week. And our browser is also unique in that it was built from the ground up to leverage the power of the Amazon Web Services cloud infrastructure um, to essentially enhance the power and performance of a browser running on a mobile device, which has constrained um, CPU capacity and memory and, and often network also. And the browser architecture fundamentally kind of changes the game in terms of splitting the components between what runs on the device and what runs within the cloud and can adjust that split dynamically depending on conditions, off, offloading some of the computation and, and networking interactions to, to the cloud to accelerate the browser. Um, but it's exciting. It's, it's effectively still day one for us. And <laughs> I'm glad we were invited to join the panel. Thank you. My pleasure. So. Um, Ah, Manu Sporny, please come to the mic. Hi, so um, we've seen a lot of new technologies kind of uh, uh, explained uh, at, at this conference, right? We've seen um, everything from touch events to, you know, HTML5 games. Um, and I think it's really interesting how some of these technologies are unveiled to the public. Right, so I think that there's a, there there are many times uh, we unveil technology to the public and it's and it's looked at in a very favorable favorable light, in other ways where sometimes the browser manufacturers say this is a new technology and it's not looked at in as favorable of a light. So I, I think one of these examples is Dart, right? Uh, so I was I, I was I was interested to hear what, 
each browser vendor's position is on Dart, um, and maybe even Speedy. And then uh, I, I'm, I'm interested if, if you guys think that that is, that is the way that technology should be developed in the future from browser manufacturers or if that there's a different way of, of kind of unveiling technology to the public. So could you define your terms, please? <laughs> Dart and Speedy. Wait, say, say again? Just, just so not everyone m might know about Dart and Speedy, uh, so you might just briefly mention. Right, so Dart, it, Dart is, uh, has been unveiled as kind of like this JavaScript killer. It's the replacement for JavaScript. Um, and uh, Speedy is kind of like the replacement for HTTP. To use the most emotionally charged you know, words I can. <laughs> and that's, and that's, I trust that's, that's you to do the so. There's no value judgment in there. You could have. <laughs> OK, so yeah, go ahead, Art. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's absolutely fan. The, the, the thing that's the, the beauty of the open web platform is that it is an open platform. And, and it facilitates all kinds of innovation. You know, so from that perspective, experiments in JavaScript performance, experiments in network performance, I think are absolutely fantastic. Um, I, don't, I can't say anything about what we might or might not do with respect to you know, releasing them in a product. But if some of that stuff gets into the open source, uh, or maybe some of it's already in, in some of the open source projects that, that you know, we're contributing with and, and deploying, then we would, you know, we naturally we could get it that way. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's all I have to say. Any of the other? Well, oh, only Peter, who's ship, shipping Speedy, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we love Speedy. It's, it's interesting because you know, HTTP has been around for so long, and it was it was designed for a different environment than what we're running in today often. And um, as we looked at what the interconnect should be between the, the front end, the, the software running on the device, and what runs within the cloud, Speedy was a, an obvious choice because it's a way you can send HTTP requests over a channel that um, handles all the things HTTP doesn't necessarily do very well, like requires encryption, um, has you know full um, multiplexing without having to worry about head of line blocking that you get with HTTP pipelining. So, but your question wasn't so much as you know specifically about Speedy, but about the process of how um, these new um, potential standards emerge, and you know I kind of see it as 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 necessary because we're, in a way any new idea has to be tested and some ideas are going are going to be great ideas and some may not be as great and uh, one way to find that out is to get it in a customer's hands see how it runs see what the adoption is and um, if it sticks then start going through the process of turning it into a standard so i i think in both cases um, I just love working in this field when you have so many smart people telling the other smart people that there's new ideas. Dart and Speedy are exactly that. But I think it's also really important that we actually realize that um, you know, we, we need to find a venue for each of these things and figure out how to get both of those communities together so we don't end up breaking something that's out there, that it may be endorsed and adopted very quickly in a very narrow environment, and we want it to be used in a much wider environment. So just before the panel started, we were talking about, well, when is Speedy going to go to the IETF? And I think the current news is probably at the March IETF meeting in 2012, all right? But Peter admitted that you know, they had to make some changes to Speedy in order to, uh, from version three. So you know, there's a, a risk balance here that we're constantly, all of the implementers and you developers, even more importantly, are trying to balance. How do we take these really great ideas and turn them into something that everybody here can actually use so you can build websites that will work on the same content or the same protocol? So I'm, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with how anyone is announcing all of these great ideas. And we should just embrace as many of those as possible. But when you've got this number of companies that need to figure out how to implement those things, we need an environment like the W3C, IETF, TC39, which does uh, ECMAScript, to actually take those ideas and get a common opinion about what everybody is actually going to implement. Uh, I think Charles, you missed your so, so I wanted to take a slightly different WebP and WebM. Right? I mean, these are four technologies, all of which came out of Google. WebM has pretty wide deployment. 
right? It's a video format that you can use, and a whole lot of people use it because it's like it's not actually competing and breaking an existing system. It's trying to build a, an HTML5 video platform that's open and free and anyone can use. WebP doesn't really replace Java, uh, JPEG on the web, right? It turns out in, in Opera Mini and Opera Turbo, in our cloud-based systems, we use WebP because it, it's nice, it's efficient. Putting it into our cloud to client system doesn't break anyone else's stuff. But there's an awful lot of people who've got a camera and their camera probably takes JPEGs. Right? And they've got imaging editing software that they didn't win today and it probably edits JPEGs. And so there's this huge investment in that, you know, in the infrastructure there. Changing that over is really hard. Sometimes it's worthwhile. Sometimes it turns out, you know, it's not clear when it's worthwhile actually changing. So you ship a bit and see what people take up. But there was another question Manu asked, which is, is this the model that browser makers should turn up with the innovations and say, hey world, here you are, this is what you get? And, and the answer is no. Browser makers do do that, right? We represent six of dozens of companies making up new stuff, figuring out new things that you could do on the web. But there's no reason why browser makers need to be the ones who do that. You know, people who produce content, people who figure out how security works, don't have to work for a browser company to come up with an idea that's worth promoting. It's got to get implemented somewhere. You can go to a browser company, you can go to an open source project, you can start from scratch and write your own. There are different ways of driving innovation. But there's a, you know, a lot of talk around W3C about how you know, the browsers are key to everything. It's like the browsers are the thing that everyone depends on. It's, no, the browsers are a key. The browsers are one part of the puzzle. Developers are a key. If developers don't use stuff, it doesn't work, right? It's not real. There are multiple keys, and there are multiple places the innovations should be coming from. And Tante, thanks, well, Charles. Well, well said, Charles. Uh, good innovation, good ideas come from everywhere. And I think that's really an important point to continue to recognize. There is, however, I think one of the, one of the challenges sort of hidden inside uh, Manu's question that should be addressed. And uh, that is the nature of how some of these supposedly open developments are developed and then launched on the web. And that is the problem of what we call delayed open. Uh, if you want to read further about that, go ahead and search for delayed open, Google, Facebook, and you'll see an entire blog post about the problem. But in short, uh, there are some technologies, say HTML5, uh, that you know, the participants in that develop and brainstorm features very much in the open, on open mailing lists, on wikis, like even from just when just a piece of an idea gets proposed and gets developed. Other technologies uh, by various vendors are, are launched into products without ever being uh, openly discussed. And I think that that's a problem. Uh, that's, that's not, we've learned to be more open than that. We've learned to do better development than that. And I think you know, that's, that's one of those judgments we need to make, technology for technology. Surprisingly insightful answers. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I won't repeat it. You have a. Oh, please say, say your name as well. I'm Alex Komorowski from uh, Google and Chrome, actually. Uh, Charles, to your point, um, I think it's definitely important for web developers to be involved in the sort of helping drive uh, or influencing the future of the open web platform. What do you think practically are the best ways for web developers, like the people in this room, to, to really participate? So simple practical things are try out the technology, right? Take it for a spin, use it, write about it, learn about it. Teach someone else about it. See one, make one, teach one. And that gives you some sense of what's being developed, and it gives you some ideas about what will and won't work. Just the same as you know, we try out some technology and say, well, yeah, this is good, or this isn't so great. You come back and say, the, the example that recently came up, a workshop on offline applications and app cache, it's like all the developers who turn up say, yeah, app cache is great, sort of, kind of, except it doesn't really work well. And it's a pain to use. And it doesn't actually solve the problem that I needed it to solve. Um, yeah. So part of that is 
figure out how to fix it. Part of that is look around and see what else there is, right? When you've got a hammer, you, know, you might find that there are things that aren't nails, they're actually screws, and you might find a screwdriver is not so hard to find. That's another key. Yeah, who in this room has got an app cache to work across more than one browser? Let's see the hands. One, two. Okay, so. Oh, I saw two well, out in TV land there. <laughs> okay. Well, who's got an app cache they, to work? They're not on waving their drowning. <laughs> so I think that pretty clearly shows there's a problem there. Yeah, so file bugs. Yeah. On either your favorite or your least favorite browser to start out with. <laughs> um, um, and uh, lots of the uh, browser vendors that are represented here have blogs where we're loving to get public input. Uh, uh, Tontech Ton really helped the W3C two weeks ago by making the uh, technical plenary week much more into a bar camp kind of environment where we started to get a lot more developer input into what should actually be happening. So I think as the W3C itself starts to open up and doing stuff in a much more developer-oriented way, I'd encourage you to attend events like this and look on the W3C site for the community groups and get involved in that sort of stuff. But I'll, I'll make a pitch for a personal item. I think there's some working groups in the W3C that have menus of things they want to work on that are this long. And I'd love to hear from developers which ones you want at the top of the list. Yeah. All right. I think that that would be super valuable for working groups at the W3C to actually have to say, this web app spec is more important than this one down here. And tell us why. Uh, Art? Yeah, so I'll, I'll follow up on that real quickly. So as a chair of the web events working group, and the, the two Garrett's mentioned that today, and co-chair of with uh, Charles on the web applications working group. We indeed are one of the working groups that has literally dozens of specifications. <laughs> no, I think it's a little bit bigger okay. than that. <laughs> you missed a couple. Okay. And uh, so not only do I plus one the recommendation to file bugs on our specs, but we have mail lists that, that literally has over 600 people on it. And within the working group, we're, we're well represented by implementers, but we're sorely missing feedback from developers. And you know, join the mail list, submit bugs. Um, I, I would be delighted to have more feedback from you guys. And, and as the staff contact for that working group, uh, I, 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 pre I agree, and I, I also uh, library developers are especially important, not just regular developers, in addition to regular developers. Charles, I thought. Nope. I, I had actually had a question for, for both of you. You talked about providing feedback on kind of prioritizing that, that backlog. What, what is the mechanism that developers can use to give input on, and is there visibility into what that backlog is? Email public-webapps at w3.org for the web apps group. And I but think more generally, CSS's list is www dot. You know, so, so yeah, so uh, all of us uh, are people who you can email. We'd be glad to give you the pointers, you know, and you know, I'd, I'd be glad to actually point people at the right places to actually do that. But there's lots of uh, uh, venues at the W3C for the public to be directly involved. Um, and you know, I've, I'm starting to see this more and more inside Microsoft now. For the last two or three years, the people that knock on my door at Microsoft were from the IE team. And now the people that knock on my door are people at Microsoft that want to use HTML5, not the browser, not the employees that work for the browser. It's people that are going to produce the content. And I actually believe we need those people telling us what specs we should actually be doing. It, it was OK for us to build the basement. But if we're going to build the first story and the second story here, like we need more people telling us what the HTML5 house should actually look like. Okay, it looks like we've got another question. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, Sean Madero, uh, University of Washington. Though uh, for this question, I guess I'm wearing my uh, invited expert HTML working group hat. Um, recently, a consultant for Mozilla brought up uh, the notion that vendor prefixes are harmful for the web. This is around the idea of uh, dash WebKit, dash MS, you know, dash O, and CSS3 prefixes. 
And, but the, not to drill down to a specific technology, but to think about this question that we're talking about, about how do we deploy features to developers? Um, how do they, what is the shape of that? Is it frequent releases? Is it syntax, you know, um, deploying it by syntax, et cetera? And I think, you know, the position he's putting out there is that because Dash WebKit gets so popular in all of the demos and all of the tutorials and evangelism tools, people just start cutting and pasting that. It gets deployed around. Uh, and even if you're one of the devs who are aware that there's all these multiple prefixes, you're now using all these complicated systems like Less.js to generate your CSS. Um, so it's becoming more complicated for developers to support this kind of ecosystem. So what is the right way to deploy new features to the web uh, so that we're not in a position where Microsoft is actually considering or was considering implementing Dash WebKit prefixes in their engine? <laughs> you know, that, that's a bad state for them to be in as well as us as developers, so. We've been there. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's start with that one. Uh, I think Chris, Chris raised give Chris. Chris a go. Oh, sure. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of take on, on vendor prefixes, and we went through this a really long time ago. Like somebody was saying yesterday, I think, in the, the IRC back channel that, um, there was a question of whether we ever did a dash ms dash um, at Microsoft and IE, and, and I, I don't recall us ever doing one, but I know that um, Office, talking about generating content, actually did spit out a whole lot of dash MSO dash properties at one point. And my take was that was actually not the way to use it. I told them that at the time, of course, but, uh, but when you can actually set it up as this is the way to get something out there and test it out, as long as you have a way to sunset it and you have a plan for sunsetting it and you're actually driving this into the standard and trying to get people to agree and figure out what it's supposed to look like and you're actually going to shut it off at some point in the relatively near future, um, obviously having a rapid release cycle helps that quite a bit. I think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to get real feedback on how the properties work because otherwise you can't really tell how it's going to work in, in the real world. Uh, Charles? So, I don't know about vendor prefixes. Bad teaching is pretty bad for the web. You know, bad development practice where you go down these you know, little dead-end rat holes and assume that that's where the world is going to live. Deploying that's pretty bad for the web. Experimental features. Right. You know, experimental features are experimental. You know, don't put them into the bank. You know, use, yeah. use what you should have at the time. The, you know, I, I also think you know, one monolithic browser to rule them all and bind them in the darkness is bad for the web, right? <laughs> the alternative is that you have a number of different browsers and a number of different authoring frameworks and tools and developers, and in order to get stuff coming out of all of those people, you know, in order to allow everybody to innovate, you've got to have some kind of mechanism. And so you know, vendor prefixes are about as good a, an approach as any. You know, they're terrible, except for all the other things we tried, which are worse. Um, we've got to figure out how to live with them. But yeah, sunset them, get rid of them. So it's an interesting comment from someone whose browser logo looks like a ring. <laughs> <laughs> You've uh, discovered our strategy. Actually, uh, I believe Paul was first yeah. in Entante. So I, I think most of us that work on in the standards environment, think of uh, prefixes as something we'd all like to get rid of when we get to candidate recommendation stage. All right, and in which case, we believe the spec is functionally good enough that we want everybody to implement it, and we want that done without a vendor prefix. The problem is we need to get to CR faster. And if we got to CR faster, which actually leads me to, I, I think, something that we have to do even better, which is do our specs in a much more modular fashion. If we got to CR faster, then the vendor prefixes wouldn't be out there for so long. You wouldn't have as many people doing view source or teaching themselves the wrong way to do it, if, that, if you agree that it's wrong. So I, I actually think part of the standards process is at fault here. We've got lots of people innovating, and we have to figure out how to move that standards process a little bit faster so that they aren't there for as long and all of us can agree, okay, that was your idea, Chris. You had a really nice Google prefix. We're going to CR. We're all going to implement it without a prefix. And that's what we should actually be trying to do and do it much better. Thanks. Tontek? Yeah, that's, that's well said. And I think that the, 
the more that we can be aggressive about dropping vendor prefixes, the better. Uh, you know, assuming that we're not just bouncing back between what, what, uh, what Paul called CR and last call and CR, and that's, in practice, that's what tends to happen. So, you know, vendor, vendor prefixes, they're kind of ugly. Having to support more than one kind of sucks in your code, but it's the best we've come up with so far. Better than broken features that are, are you know, unusable for the, for the rest of the lifetime of the web. Um, but that doesn't mean we couldn't do better. So from my understanding, we're all open to suggestions on this point. You know, if, there's a, if there are better specifics to when we introduce a vendor prefix or when we drop a vendor prefix, let's fix it. Let's make it better. So I'm, I'm going to interject a, a jargon watch. Uh, people are talking about last call and CR. Uh, CR is candidate recommendation phase. These are phases along the W3C standardization process where last call is if you have something to say, say it now, and CR is where the browser vendors finalize their implementations, sort of. <laughs> CR is after last call, right? Correct, yes. <laughs> so uh, actually, I'm, before I get to your cycle. question, I'm curious, Art, has Nokia introduced any uh, Dash Nokia, uh, not that or I'm aware even of. Dash WebKit. Like, oh. have you introduced anything? Um, I, I, in some experimental stuff that we did in our Starlight project, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we did some WebKit, but I don't know that it ever actually got into the trunk. Okay. You know. and, and Peter, since you're the new guy on the block, we, we launched about a thousand of uh, 4D. CSS animation? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have any browser. I, I wanted to say that it's, it's kind of interesting. Like Browser prefixes are, are sort of a, um, a mechanism to, to gain fast leverage. It, it's, it's a form of technical debt. Essentially. And with any form of technical debt, it's, it's not a bad idea to do it because it lets you move fast. But you also want to pay it down. And is, this, is this something you guys think, a practice that you guys think you'll, you'll be following? Or Something. No, I was speaking more generally. I, okay. I, don't, I don't see us introducing browser prefixes in the near term, um, just based on, on where we are and, and where we're focusing our, our innovation right now. So just to cause a little trouble, uh, I got a counterexample I'd like to ask the panel about, which is what about the video element? You know, we all, that was launched with no prefix and somehow got interoperably implemented and seems to work. So how did that work without a vendor prefix? And why can't we do that elsewhere? Well, um, what? I, I think the reality is that everybody understood what angle bracket video close bracket actually meant. It was cool, man. Yeah. I, I just said everybody could have and, understood what border radius meant, too, though. Yeah, and I question I mean, just exactly what you mean by work, right? <laughs> All right. At cash. Blood on the at floor cash. works. You know? First blood. Thank you, Tante. That's, yeah. why I use, that's why I use video as an example, right? So how come that didn't fail? Well, uh, the fallback was defined in the spec, wasn't it? The fallback was. Well, there was a, a fallback built directly into it, so yes. that from the get-go, as a about, developer, you I'm could fallback. Why didn't different implementations could be incompatible, like what we've seen with border radius? You mean right? like? With, you mean like, you mean like using like, H.264 instead of <laughs> you know an open format? But, but right from the get-go, there was a fallback that you could rely on for old browsers and for browsers that didn't quite, quite work properly. So, but if two if, browsers did video differently. Aside from the format issue, right? Diffused attributes differently, you'd be screwed. But that didn't happen. Yeah, but it's expensive to make it not happen. And uh, and video, you know, dash video, sorry, bracket video bracket. Really, that is not a hugely complex thing. Getting track. <laughs> video is well, not a complex thing. Video is a complex thing, but I, have I, a box and put a film in it. I, I that's not to, a concept I, I beg that to differ. people don't get. Go take a look at the code that Video JS does to support compat across across Android devices, uh, iOS devices, and every other browser, and I think you'll take that statement back. Well, I was the one who said, what do you mean by work, right? <laughs> Chris, go ahead. So I think that a, a big difference with the video element, Tontech, was that there was already a, a s large set of ways to do that functionality without using the video tag. Like, it had been deployed across all of these different browsers, all of these different sites. It wasn't like it was adding some radical new feature that you just couldn't get. Like, I mean, border radius, for example, where you just couldn't get rounded border corners before border radius uh, without, obviously, you know, making up some images, and that's not quite the same thing. So the push to implement, to use it, to deploy it in production code was relatively narrow because you didn't need it. Like, you could do it some other way, and... So Flash was the vendor prefix for video? Is that the idea? Sure. Pretty you much. Could, yeah. You could consider it that way. <laughs> I mean, there, there's other ways to embed video objects. They, 
that weren't all necessarily completely interoperable, but you know, a couple of fallbacks later, you'll, okay, you'll get so, there. So Dash Adobe worked here. Uh, go ahead. I gotta say, I think watching that uh, interaction over there, I realized why vendor prefixes. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce but, yourself, please. Uh, Andrew with WebChart MD, and I got a question about um, uh, products that combine the browser and the operating system, like Chromebook, for example. Is that something that uh, other browser vendors are planning on uh, mimicking coming out with? Is it something that's here to stay? Is it a passing fad? Or is it uh, you know, like a niche product that's going to just remain and use by 1% of people everywhere? So, so I think you find there's a bunch of people sitting here thinking, actually, it's Chrome that's mimicking all of us who've done that before they existed, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a really common pattern. And you know, what, at what layer? Do you build your applications? Sometimes you build them at the native you know, operating system layer. I'm old enough to have written actual assembler code and stuck that into you know, defined pieces of memory. Sometimes you write applications at the browser layer. And you'll, you'll find, you, know, you can go back in history for probably a decade or more and find people saying, well, here's a browser that pretty much gives you a layer where you can build the applications you want for a given environment. So you look at kiosks, uh, you look at the, I'm going to fly home on an aeroplane, and on the aeroplane it's got an entertainment system, and the entire operating system for that entertainment system is actually a piece of software called Opera. Uh, you know, all of the application is written for the web on top of that, and that's because we did a deal years and years ago. There will always be cases where people say, no, no, you know, we, want, we want to get down into the operating system or we want to do something different. But this is not a new pattern. Uh, it's been done in a lot of places. And yeah, it's here to stay as a, a thing that people do. Right? You don't always see it, but it's around you. I mean, else? I, I think that we probably all can agree on the panel that our goal is really to make the web platform where it can function, it can perform the operations, the, the, it can be the platform just like the operating system has been. And um, you know, whether that's delivered in Chrome OS or some other form it, it is not really the point. So it seems to me, oh, I think, I think there's a pretty big question being ducked here, which is that uh, it's, not, it's not always as it's been, and more and more devices are basically robbing the user of choice. So you buy an iOS device, you don't get your choice of rendering engine, right? You, you're stuck with WebKit, with whatever version of WebKit that Apple decides to push down to you that day or, or give you the option to upgrade to. Uh, you know, Chromebook, I'm not sure if you can install a different browser or not. Can you? Well, you could use a different web application on it to browse the web, but that <laughs> seems a little bizarre. <laughs> you could, you could, we'll, we'll so I'm pretty sure you could probably root the device and you know, you like strike the BIOS or something. As far but, as I know, yeah. Windows 8 uh, in the tiles, in, uh, you also are stuck with IE there. You don't get to run, it, run a different browser uh, for your Windows 8 tile apps either. So this is all, I think, you know, a very negative trend. It's robbing the user of choice. If they want to run a different browser engine that gives them more features, that has perhaps experimental features they want to try with, or perhaps they want to add various extensions or add-ons, uh, they can't do it. And as long as those devices are out there and pushing users to be used to that, you know, that's, a, that's a threat to the diversity of the web. I agree with your general uh, sentiment really strongly you know, as a, an iOS user myself. Um, but at the same time, I'd say that's not really the point of Chrome OS. Like Chrome OS is just that layer that you're going to replace. And if you want to go figure out how to get, you know, the Mozilla engine on the same hardware, that's fine. Like there, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. But you're not following the same model for that at that point. Like this isn't a we're going to build the web operating system on top of another operating system, and we're not going to let you replace the web layer part. The, the, uh, the goal with Chrome OS is really, this is just the web layer part and you know, whatever hardware we need to make it run. So can you replace the whole OS on a Chromebook? I have no idea. I believe yeah. you can, yeah, actually. We have people running like, other stuff on it. So Peter, did you, uh, can you tell a little bit about, I, I don't know. I'm, my my uh, Kindle Fire is 
sitting at my house. <laughs> Sorry about that. Waiting for me. <laughs> I I delivered it to the wrong. You. you didn't bring it with you? I should have brought it. Nice timing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, could, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? It seems like you're, you've got sort of an integrated operating system browser thing going on there, or maybe it's not. Well, so the, the Kindle Fire is, it's an Android device, and one of, the, one of the applications on the device is Amazon Silk, the browser. Um, you can install other browsers if you want to, um, but you can also run web apps within, within the device. And to you know, kind of answer the core question, if, if we continue down uh, the path that we're on, having uh, you know, HTML5 and these other standards, creating a true, uh, like a, a very rich um, application environment, then you know, maybe that model of, of the OS being the browser isn't so horrible. But it, I agree with Tontek. Like we, should, we should give users the choice. We don't want to constrain them and box them into you know, one particular path. So, so that's true. But if you look around, you know, I see an awful lot of little bright glowing apples, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, How many browsers do they have installed on those, right? <laughs> yeah. If, well, but, but you could ask the question, how many people only have Safari on the MacBook sitting in front of them? I see like two hands up. That means everyone right. else with that MacBook has at least two browsers. Yeah. <laughs> Chrome, man. Chrome, come on. So unless you guys have compelling. Let, OK, yeah. so Anne, please introduce yourself. Well, uh, Anne Bassetti, Boeing. I um, really came up here with some other questions in mind, but since you went down this path about the sort of um, many different browsers and paths and devices and so on and so on, this is, a, this is kind of a recent notable advance that the browser people are working together in the W3C, which, you know, we applaud, of course. Or is this going to continue? Past HTML5? Uh, past 5 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you a ride home, too, Charles, just on that camp. <laughs> or not. So, so one of my questions was, Charles said, I mean, somebody asked, um, how, do, how do people know to write code that will work in all these different kinds of situations? And you said, uh, follow standards, don't use experimental features. And many of the people here are the gods of the geek world. So you guys all know probably, but how about the average person out there just writing HTML? How, do, how are they supposed to find out what's experimental or not experimental? Where, what's, what's a good path for that? So this is a community of professionals, right? right? You guys are actual genuine professionals. You make money out of doing this. That's about the definition. Um, but the, the message of, you know, see one, make one, teach one, is like, as a profession, you know, there's not somebody who's there sort of dripping stuff to you like a school teacher. You, know? you guys are the custodians of your own profession. And so there's a responsibility to think about you know, how do you make sure that your peers are professional enough that you charge twice as much ne next year. Um, and, and how do you teach? You know, part of the profession is teachers. You know, Doug is involved in teaching activities at W3C, in you know, documentation, in exercises which actually go out and make information available. I mean, everyone rubbishes W3 schools. I actually use it. Um, doesn't mean it's fantastic, but it's there. And <laughs> I use other stuff as well. You look at it, you see what's there, you talk to your peers, and you learn. Right? This, this is a field that keeps changing. You've got to keep learning. So find the good teachers. They come up by peer support. Right? They come up because people say, these guys are good and know their stuff. And I think you see a lot of resources that build up that way, too. I mean, there, there are, like, the immediate answer that popped into my head when you said, you know, how do I know what I can use? Uh, well, can I use .com? Yeah. I mean, like, there's resources out there for those sorts of things. There's resources like the Mozilla Developer Network, which is not just about Mozilla. It's actually about, you know, the web standards platform and, to some degree, what you can use. So I, I think that Charles was right on in saying the set of people like those in this room are the ones who are kind of the custodians of teaching people what they can use. And I'd like people to, to take that away and you know, participate in those efforts. But they are out there. 
And there are quite a few of them. And I'm going to interrupt and plug again the Web Education Community Group at W3C, which is uh, looking at this. So. Uh, and so go to Web Education Community Group and then join the group and help. Paul? So I wanted to, to go back to Anne's first point about are the browser vendors going to continue to uh, drink beer together? Uh, and, and I think the answer is a clear yes. It's not clear to me whether we're going to do it exactly the way we've done it over the last two or three years, though. Okay, so for instance, um, at the W3C technical plenary uh, two weeks ago, I, I think we all started to realize that we have this catch-22 of working together, getting the specs right, but also getting them done. All right, and uh, so uh, I, I, I know Tontech's a big supporter of this. I think community groups at W3C are gonna be really key. All right, that we should be able to get the thing started faster, all right, and get it going without, with the least amount of overhead and actually get the browser vendors and developers, because anyone can join, into the room to find out what it is, what the minimum required to declare victory for that feature is as quickly as possible. What I came away from the W3C TPAC, the technical plenary week, was a realization that doing anything as big as HTML5 in a single monolithic spec is not going to work. So what we have to all be talking about is feature X or feature Y, and you could say the CSS level two, level three kind of approach is, is what we need to do more of. And that goes back to my earlier comment about tell us which of those specs are really important. All right, so, I, so I think we will continue to work together very definitely and at the W3C. I'm not, I'm not married as somebody that's been at the W3C for nearly 15 years to doing everything the way I did 15 years ago. I think we've got a real obligation to the community here and I think we figure out how the browser vendors can work with the community in the W3C. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some ways, and I think you're asking the wrong question, that it's not, it's not sufficient for browser vendors to work together. We need to work together in the open. Yeah. I disagree, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we probably have Time for half a question if Charles answers, or a whole question if. <laughs> so, uh, Michael Washington from the Boeing Company. One of the questions I always had about the whole web development platform is JavaScript. I mean, every browser has JavaScript as their engine, and I hate coding in JavaScript. Have you guys thought about using a, a common language like, I wouldn't say C or nothing like that, but something easier for the developer to use that got away from, you know, no object-oriented, you know, things that JavaScript has. Uh, I know I've worked with Sensha and some of these other JavaScript platforms. Have you guys thought about doing something like that or coming up with something like that? <laughs> no, no, no. Art, Art, I, don't, I don't see. Art, are you interested? In, no. Go ahead. No, no, I know no, we one. promised him he could answer this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, you did say no object-oriented nonsense, right? Is that, is that like I've right? got yeah, an answer no to that one too. What's that? No, no object-oriented nonsense. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> well, good. That doesn't mean no object orientation. It just means no. I don't know. That's what, that's what I heard. Object-oriented nonsense. Anyhow, yeah. Put that certainly. Stuff I mean, away. The, this this kind of was the goal behind a couple of different projects at Google um, to try to explore what might be useful there. And one of them is Dart, although obviously uh, it doesn't get rid of object orientation, um, and there are differing ideas on how successful it'll be. But there's also Native Client, which is kind of the same, hey, use whatever language you want. Let's provide you something you can you know, have your own code in, um, provide you a sandbox to play in, I guess, uh, in that sense. I don't think that. JavaScript the way it is today, I don't think anyone believes that's the ultimate end of languages we want to have on the web platform. But you know, the, the problem is you put five people into a room and say, which parts are the object-oriented nonsense parts? And you're going to get six or more answers. Um, and they're all going to be different. It's easy to just ask D Doug Crockford. He's got the answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Could we have Doug stand in for him? Give him? So, didn't IE once run 
Visual Basic as a scripting <laughs> language? VB script. I mean, VB script. Yeah, yeah. and the, the problem is, have you thought about what would happen if five browsers each said, yeah, you're right, we're going to come up with a new language and we're going to ship a new language instead of JavaScript and we turn up to you guys and said, oh, you should all be developing in Google Script and Opera Script and Chrome Script and Microsoft Script and Mozilla Script. It's like there's, there's something in that scenario that I think would be suboptimal as well. So, but yeah, that's, people that's, keep that thinking of the like, problem. That sounds well. like changing the web platform is hard. <laughs> that's that's have you shopping. found something that you like better? No, no. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> but, I mean, it's just sitting on top of uh, like, JavaScript, and that's cappuccino. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, but is it a problem that it's sitting on top? I mean, C sits on top of a compiler that sits on top of something else, and the JavaScript sits on top of a C compiler. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. where, where does your tool need to be? Yeah. And the answer is, it's got to be performant, right? right. Your website's got to work. Uh, you want it to be interoperable. Yeah. Having JavaScript everywhere at least right now gives you that and you can build all sorts of stuff on top of it. Right. And, and one of the stated goals for, uh, for ECMAScript in the future is that it specifically support building frameworks on top of it in a very performant way. I mean that's been true for a couple of years now at least. So, so I think that you'll see that, uh, that pattern emerge more and more as yeah. something that, that does need to be very performant. So okay. I did a lot of work at W3C on XML and at a certain point, I said, OK, it's pipe. It's behind the wall. It's disappeared. All right. Eventually, I'll predict five, six years from now, JavaScript will be the same. It'll be the copper pipe that's behind the wall. It's what we all implement in our browser engines to give you the interoperability. And there'll be various frameworks layered on top of it to make programs like you happier. Thank you. So vote for copper pipe. <laughs> copper pipe. <laughs> so in other words, we're all plumbers. We just don't get paid the same way. Is it like Colonel Mustard with the iron bar in the kitchen? Or? <laughs> oh, no. Frederick. Um, Frederick Hirsch, Nokia. Um, so how much can and should browser vendors do to help with privacy? Or is that the web application developer's responsibility entirely? As much as we can. And I know there's do not track at the W3C, but is there more that you're either experimenting with or would like to promote? So it's a kind of tricky question. Um, you know, on the one hand, everyone wants to have their privacy, uh, but everyone also wants the services that rely on knowing who you are, right? How much can the browser vendors do and how much should the application developers do? It's sort of an implementation question. and. First, it's like, how much privacy do we want? Right. And, and that's not a question. That is certainly not a question the browser developers should decide. That's a question that societies decide for themselves. Without getting a sense of what the answer is to that, it's kind of premature to be you know, parceling out the job because you don't know what the work is. And, but yeah, more is probably what browser vendors could do, probably what they should do, and app developers should probably do more as well. Go ahead, Paul. So uh, the tracking protection work that's going on at W3C, I think, presents W3C with an interesting conundrum. All right, uh, the membership approved the work and I actually believe that once the working group was created, we discovered we had a different membership in the working group. Because, of course, one man's tracking protection is another man's advertising blocking. All right, And I actually think it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out in the W3C to see whether we can find consensus. And remember, W3C is a consensus organization not like your city council that approves that road behind your house by a vote of seven to six. Um, and so we have to find a consensus uh, in the W3C between the advocates of both sides. And I will also point out, not only are there advertisers and browser developers in the room, there's also policy makers in the room who love to enforce things. Uh, that was your point earlier, Tan Tech. And, and so we have to realize that they play in this game as well. So if you want to watch a really interesting dynamic in the W3C, that's a really interesting working group to see how it's going to play out. 
Chris, did you want to say anything? You, you're sort of squirming on your chair there. No, I, I, I actually agree with a lot of what Paul said. I think um, the interesting thing about privacy to me has always, because there was a, a point in time, I'm sure some people in the room probably even remember, where I would rail about Google and online privacy because they do have a lot of information because of how ads work and syndication works and all this other stuff. And, and I would explain this to friends of mine, like you know, non-geek uh, non friends of mine, and in great detail. And they would, um, they'd be like, oh, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> and I'd be like, but dude! <laughs> and, and I think that um, I'm, I'm simultaneously all about making sure that people always have the tools to control their own privacy and to manage their own privacy as well as recognizing that um, you can't just leave it to the end user to, and say, hey, you're on your own. That's kind of like saying, you know, well, geez, you have a copy of Fiddler and the restricted zones in IE. You can block anything you want. Go figure it out. Because um, that's not a solution for me, let alone for me. And you know, that I think that we do need to spend a lot more time looking at, how, at what tracking does and what it's used for and how to enable the good uses while at least making people aware of the maybe not as good uses. So uh, you guys have uh, said a lot about tracking. I just wanted to mention uh, as a plug that there's other work around privacy going on at W3C. Uh, for example, there's the uh, cryptography, cryptography API that I think was prototyped at Mozilla. And uh, there's, the, uh, there's just a general identity work that one of my colleagues, Harry Halpin, is heading up. And that, that's also going to play into both policy and what happens in a browser. And this is really important work that people should be paying attention to. Um, did you guys have anything to add to well, the discussion? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, looks like we have <coughs> eight minutes left. <coughs> Anne, did you have another question? I have just a question of curiosity more than anything else. Uh, you guys all represent significant browsers mostly in the Western world. Maybe that probably includes Norwegians, and uh, they were in the West. <laughs> I live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, forget Canada. <laughs> I was just curious if if um, if there are browsers in other parts of the world that are necessitated by non-Western languages or other kinds of situations, low bandwidth. I don't know what what you know, other variables. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I guess you see web which is like Opera Mini or like uh, Silk. You know, it's a proxy-based browsing thing. It's big in China. Uh, it's pretty much unknown elsewhere. Um, there are, there's quite a lot of browsers. The, you know, the five, six, seven, nine, however many browsers, you know, Access is a, a browser company. How many people, when they think of the browser manufacturers, think of Nokia? How many people would have thought Nokia if you said, list the big browser manufacturers? There are over... Right. <laughs> How many non-Nokia employees? <laughs> <laughs> I said people. <laughs> <laughs> but Nokia, as Art said, ships a boatload of browsers, um, plus has shipped a boatload of ours. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a, there's I, a lot I, of browsers so out there I, meeting I, different I, needs. I wasn't joking when I said I was from Canada. Well, I, know I mean, to be the fact. browser market is not in North America. Yeah. It's not in Europe. It's everywhere. And, really and so, so our browser software, I mean, if we can't sell it in, uh, in full Unicode uh, glory with being able to do right to left and right to left and up and down, I mean, we're dead. So, so in that context, I think all of our businesses are oriented around making sure that that thing works uh, worldwide. That was really part I mean, of my, I mean, I was just curious what other browsers exist, but that was the internationalization aspects and how can we bring the rest of the world into the, into the family oh. was well, the we, emphasis. We, we, we can go to their house, right? <laughs> Fine, please. Aside from that, I mean, more than, uh, there's more than 70 localized versions of Firefox that are, for the most part, localized by communities around the world. And so this is a browser that's built internationally uh, even what you might consider the English version is built by people across almost every time zone. So there, there's a lot of international contribution going on to existing browsers and you know, customized for specific locales and markets. 
that's happening today. Go ahead, yeah, so just super briefly, um, I mean, I, I would say for every person sitting up here, there's somebody else in an office somewhere who's working on our browser in a different language with a different set of layout constraints with a, you know, a very, like one of my favorite things actually about having been involved in, particularly in layout and topography, um, you know, five, 10 years ago was the fact that I learned a tremendous amount about other languages and the weird things they do with layout and topography and the, the, the things that are necessitated because of that. Like I don't, you know, I don't read Japanese, um, but I do know how a bunch of Japanese layout things work. Um, because I had to go figure that out and have discussions about them and you know, drill in and find somebody who did know how they work and, and work through that in a browser. So uh, in addition to the browsers being in different languages, the content should be in different languages and the documentation on how to create the content should be in different yeah. languages. I'm plugging the web education community group where you can hum, <laughs> come and, and help translate this documentation. I'd, I'd just like to make uh, one other pitch because it's something that I spend a lot of time in the HTML working group. Not, not only do we have to think of communities that are uh, geographically separated, but we have to think of the accessibility aspects of what we're doing. So those are people that don't have as good eyesight as we do, they don't have as good hearing as we do. And so I think this is something that W3C uh, is doing, is working very hard at making sure that the browser's uh, technology that we can ship enables everyone to take advantage of the web, regardless of where they live, but also regardless of their capabilities when it comes to uh, accessibility. And there are lots of resources on W3, uh, which I shared earlier in my presentation, around uh, accessibility and also around how to do internationalization. We have excellent resources. Farouk, last question of the day. This is not a very technical question, uh, um, or not at all actually, but do any of these browsers have any women working as representatives? <laughs> <laughs> well, those two have long hair. <laughs> Doesn't count. Where's Divya? Divya's the only one here, but... Uh, j just so you know, before Charles came in, Divya was, the, 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 yeah. was going to be on the panel, but... Divya? Do you work for Opera? <laughs> so, so I manage a team of, of five technical diplomats, as I call them in Microsoft. Two of them are women and three are male. All right. uh, if we go into some of the uh, areas in W3C, you go into the accessibility area. I, I think, uh, I don't know if Cynthia is still here. Um, no, she's not. No, okay. But I, I think that there's areas where actually uh, the female softer view of the web dominates, which is darn good thing. Because sometimes, let me tell you, as a co-chair of the HTML working group, there is way too much testosterone in the room. <laughs> At a recent uh, technical plenary in California, there was a photograph taken uh, because there were, for the first time, quite a few women attending. An increasing number of women. I can say there's never a line for the bathroom. But, <laughs> <laughs> and so, the, People noticed that and there were a bunch of pictures taken to document the fact that increasing yeah. numbers of women are participating and I encourage all women to get out there. It's a great group of guys. So, so it's interesting to look in this room and it's like, yeah. how many people here are women, right? <laughs> <laughs> like all the women. If you go you know, to an, an equivalent kind of event in Moscow, you'll find that there's a much higher proportion of women. And yeah. Different countries, different societies di have different levels of participation and different senses of what's well, a normal thing to do. Different yeah. levels of hostility. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't yeah. that, I don't think that answers the question, though, right? I mean, you're, that's, no. that's kind of high level. I mean, I'll, I'll address Ferg's question directly, which is that uh, much of the CSS specs that all of you come to rely and depend on are edited by a woman that works for Mozilla. I mean, her alias yeah. is Fantasai online and her name is Elka and she has worked very hard on numerous specifications and test suites uh, and has definitely uh, been essential to a lot of the developments in our field. So yeah, I mean, to answer your question, absolutely yes. She's not here on stage. I did make a point of uh, seeking out female speakers. I could have just picked from the multitude of male or neuter speakers I could have gotten. <laughs> I don't want to judge. 
Um, but I did make a point of getting some female speakers. And, it, and it actually, it was more difficult than you might think. And so I, that's actually, for whatever reason, it's a call out to women that you are welcome here, and we want you to be part of this conversation. So I can speak to this personally, because my daughter started out in computer science in university and left after a year and a half. So I, I don't think we have only the problem here. We have a problem in the education system about making computer science and mathematics in general more attractive to the smarter sex. I, I got into you know, standards and the web through my mum, who was actually doing the job I do before me. So yeah, there are women. Broadly, we're roughly representative of the society that we come out of. And I think it's not a surprise you've got six, seven white guys sitting up here because that's pretty common in America. And if we were in a different place, you might see something different. And that's it. We have run out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, panelists, I really thank you very much for everything you do within W3C and for serving on this panel. Me too.